And see if I can share my screen. Thank you so much, Sister D. Uh, Brother Craig, what is the title of this, please? Uh, I don't really entitle these weekly ones, but we're we're continuing to look at the connections between the, the seals in Revelation six and the chariots in Revelation in Zechariah six. But okay, tonight we're actually continuing the thread of this understanding the word to turn in Zechariah 6 1 and it tells us the prophet says I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold and there came four chariots out from between the two mountains and the mountains were mountains of brass and we looked at this word turned in Hebrew actually for several studies because the word is so frequently used the word shub in Hebrew, and then we've been looking at the parallel word in the Greek for several studies now, epistrepo. And we see it has this idea of turning back to worshiping the true God and, and turning away from our sin and turning to a face-to-face -face love relationship with our heavenly husband. And turning the hearts of the children back to the fathers, all these ideas connected with, and especially the idea of, of conversion, a conversion, a supernatural conversion process that God works as part of our salvation. And I think we left off last week. So that's, so we're looking at this word turn in, in the Greek. Um, and at least for the, the lately, I have been putting all of the studies up uh, uh, weekly on on the Another Voice from Heaven channel. So, and I put the date that it was recorded for anybody who's wanting to keep up with all the studies. So we last looked, I believe, in Acts chapter three and verse nineteen. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Can someone read that for us? We can just quickly recount this passage and then move on and then looking at how this word is used in the scriptures. Three nineteen. Please. Hold on. It is. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when this time when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the lord amen thank you brother so here we have the repent ye therefore and be converted so you actually have the the, the idea of this turning idea in both the word repent and converted so the word epistrepho that we've been looking at is specifically translated here as converted. So there's this turning away from sin and then being transformed because we're coming back to a face-to-face -face relationship with Christ. And as we behold him, we're changed. And it, it's the process that leads to the sins being blotted out. Not just forgiven, but actually blotted out and there was only one day connected with the blotting out of sin. And we've seen that that's the day of atonement. And so this is the concluding process of the day of atonement involves this turning process, which enables us to see the chariots and the horses, the way God wants us to see them and understand them. Because we're going through the turning process together with him. That's the presence of the Lord. This transformation has to happen with him because we're beholding him and we're, we're being led by him and it's all about him. And it leads to these brother times Craig, of refreshing. Craig. Yes, Brother David. Um, <clears throat> the, this, this will be on the day of atonement when the sins are blotted out and there is yet to come an official day of atonement for the world, is that correct? Or for God's people? Uh, 
Well, that's a whole a, study that in that itself. No, I mean, the Day of Atonement itself began in 1844, October 22nd, 1844. And that work of final atonement has been ongoing ever since. That's, you know, 178 years. But there's a concluding process to the Day of Atonement. See, I talked about this in my recent sermon on Zechariah and Revelation connection connected to the seals. That this concluding process, you know, we as Adventists have been really experts on the initiation of the process of the Day of Atonement. And that's what we teach in our understanding of the sanctuary and the law and, and the character of God and his work as our heavenly high priest in a most holy place of a heavenly sanctuary. All those things were connected with the understanding needed to initiate the Day of Atonement. But there's a concluding process to finish that brings the Day of Atonement to a close. And we've not been as careful students of that process as we have of the process of initiation. And it involves this, some of the things that we've been studying and trying to understand here of, of coming into this re relationship with Christ as our King. Mm -hmm. That, that the, king is, the King is the one we marry. The, the, the King actually makes a marriage for his son and on his wedding day, he actually becomes King himself. Um, and he needs a bride who's made herself ready, who's, who, who's dressed in white, who's had her sins blotted out through accepting his atonement for us and coming into a, a holy union and truly the at one -ment process. The, the, the day of at one -ment can't come to a close until we are actually at one with Christ, his people. That's, that's the whole point of the day of atonement. And so- So the- Go ahead. So- so the atonement, the initiation, the initiating of the atonement started in 1844 and will conclude, will conclude at some point. And at the conclusion of the atonement, that's when the Holy Spirit is poured out and received, correct? Well, see there, yes, but let's, let's look at that a little bit more here. We have the times of refreshing in this verse, the times of refreshing. That's the, that's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with the latter rain. In, in, with latter rain power, but that process, that, that, that giving of that latter rain is modeled by the giving of the early rain on the day of Pentecost. And the, the significant event connected with the early rain on the day of Pentecost was Christ becoming our high priest in heaven. He was inaugurated as high priest in heaven and initiated his work in the heavenly sanctuary. And he was given a special anointing as priest to do his work as high priest in heaven. And the Holy Spirit, once Christ was anointed as high priest in heaven, then the people on the earth, the apostles, and then those who preached to them received an anointing of the Holy Spirit. But the anointing of, so of, of the people on earth was connected to the anointing of, of Christ in heaven. So when so we have to be true, right? So today, when we're looking for the latter rain, which is an even greater manifestation of the Holy Spirit on a global scale, that it would be also connected with an anointing of Christ in heaven. And that anointing of Christ is not Christ as priest, but Christ as king. And that's what we've been studying. And that kingly anointing is this times of refreshing. To, to come into the presence of Christ we have to be completely cleansed and be without sin. The sin can't dwell in his presence. But his presence is returning to this earth. He's coming back. And he needs to have a people who have been cleansed to be with him when he comes. And so that, that doesn't all happen in a day. It's a process. And in fact, it's, there's a, a repetition of what happened, in a sense, at the beginning of the Advent movement, in the beginning of the the Day of Atonement, that that process initiates at the, that was connected with the judgment of the dead, but we've been looking at once the time comes for the judgment of the living, which is the completion of the process, that that, that, that there's a special process that happens to, 
to bring that about. It isn't just a one-time event and it's over. It's a process that happens over a period of time to complete the process of this blotting out through bringing his presence. We're I being see. invited to, you know, it says in Revelation 3, the, the Church of Laodicea, he says, I stand at the door and knock. We're being invited to come into the presence of the king of the universe, our heavenly husband who loves us. And he says, all you need to do is just give up your sin and you can come into my presence and then be with me. And being in my presence will give you the power to overcome so that you don't fall away and leave me anymore. Because I don't want you to leave me anymore. I want us to be together and, and no longer ever be separate. And so, so, if I'm so being correct. just one last thought we've been separate from God for so long that we don't really understand mm. what that really means to not separate from him but but that's what he's that's what he's inviting us into right now yes and I believe this process that is that is involved has begun that we have the evidence yes, that the has. final process has begun yes it has. Um, so if I'm reading this correctly, it's coming in order. The blotting out must occur first before the time of refreshing. No, they're simultaneous. Oh, they're simultaneous. They can't, there could be no blotting out without the refreshing coming with it. The repenting and okay. being converted has to be well, right. also simultaneous is really triggers the process for you personally. The process might already be happening for other people. It starts happening yeah. for you when you repent and convert. Yeah, the mind is being cleaned out. I, I, I can feel that. I can see it. The it's mind gone. is being cleaned out. And it's his presence that's, that's making that possible. That's making you even aware of that. Yes. Yes. And he's working I with see each it. one of us individually as if there was no one else on the earth. He's acutely aware of everything you're going through and everything you're thinking and everything you're feeling and even the things you don't know about yourself. And he isn't wants to that marvelous though that he can do yes. that? Isn't that isn't that incredibly because we're not I mean obviously I'm not the only person on this earth. He can do that with every single person at the same time yeah i find that incredible that's why we bow the knee it's because yes. it's just mind-boggling yeah, it's mind-boggling that's right he has a perfect plan to deal with and help each one of us with every single issue that we're, we're struggling with he already has the perfect plan and and he, he, we have this call for turning here in this verse that's telling us if we will just do that we will just turn to him and behold him and see him that he will do this because the anointings happened in heaven now the anointings available for us on earth and there's power available that wasn't before there's an experience available that wasn't before and we're supposed to believe it by faith and to move forward in faith Mm -hmm. You shouldn't become discouraged and say, well, I've tried that before and it failed. No, he's saying, no, this is something special. I'm coming and you're going to be with me. And it's the time has come for the marriage. Stop cheating on me. Stop running around with others. <clears throat> Just choose me and be with me. And brother, the, the, what, you're, what you're describing, the cheating and the running around with others, that can also be going on inside the human mind and heart. Oh, that's, a, that's mostly what I meant. I mean, some people actually manifest well, it in outward behavior, but yeah, that's explicit. But it happens in, in a, an untold number of ways in all kinds of behavior and also in all kinds of wrong thinking, which is the, the real source of the problem. Is the wrong thinking. Yes. Mm. That's why we, we behold yeah. him most clearly in his word, because that shows us his thinking. And that's what he's trying to fix is our thinking. Yes. This power, this presence of the Lord that is talking about here, this is not the second coming. This is 
prior to the second coming because it's still connected with the process of the blotting out of sin, which happens before his second coming. Okay, yeah, yeah. The second coming is in verse 20, verse 20, actually. <laughs> he shall send Jesus after this repentance, conversion, sin blotting out, times of refreshing, presence of the Lord experience happens, then he'll send Jesus. And when we go through the turn, this turning process, each one of us individually, then we, like Zechariah, can look and behold the messengers, the four messengers, which are the four spirits of the heavens, and we can actually become living witnesses of that message to others, because we've received the message and gone through it ourselves. Yes. It's the first, second, and third angels' messages, and with the fourth angel joining with the power to lighten the earth with his glory. That's his presence. When Moses wanted to, to see God and come into his presence, you know, he said, I'll make all of my glory to pass by you. Revelation 18.1, and the whole earth lightened with his glory, and this, this verse right here, Acts 3.19, are very interconnected. We're talking about the same process. Okay, what was that revelation again? Revelation 18, verse 1. That's the so-called fourth angel that joins the third angel, the three angels' messages. And it causes, the, the, where the second angel's message is given a additional emphasis and all three messages blend as one and then there's this supernatural anointing and power to to ripen the harvest to bring the process to maturity we talked we talked about that in studying the seals in revelation six about how the first four seals bring through a maturity bring you through a, a maturity of the message and the process where it comes to completion where either you're mature in righteousness together with christ or you're mature in unrighteousness separate from christ depending on how you receive or refuse to receive the message or the message is So let's press on. We're on to look at Acts chapter 9 tonight, Acts chapter 9. And here, of course, we're learning about, we're in a section on Peter's ministry. The beginning of the chapter, we have Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. And when he begins preaching, then it turns to Peter's ministry. <clears throat> Acts 9, we can start maybe verse 32 for context, ultimately looking at verse 35 in the, as the focus of our study tonight. And it came to pass, as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwell at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years, excuse me, was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he rose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron, or Sharon, saw him and turned to the Lord. And this word turned is, of course, this word epistrepho that we've been looking at. And it's an interesting story here. Where here, it, again, it's after Pentecost. It's after the stoning of Stephen. And he's now going about all quarters. They've, they've started to, they've gone, been through persecution, been forced to go out to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles. And here he's 
meets this man who's been in bed eight years from palsy. And what's the, the word from Jesus? Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, and he commanded him to arise and make his bed, and he arose immediately. So this turning process, and that leads others, when they see how Jesus makes this man whole, that leads them to also turn to the Lord. See, when we, let, when we ourselves turn to the Lord and let Christ make us whole, that's going to be attractive to other people, to lead them to turn to the Lord. And that ought to be motivation for us to ourselves turn to the Lord. For the blessing that it will bring to others around us. We see this idea of arising or standing up. And we've, we've talked about how Michael stands up. That's the king. Jesus taking back his rightful dominion and ruling according to his will. From Daniel eleven three. And here, when Jesus stands up and he stands at the door and knocks to Laodicea, that's the king. And he tells us to also stand up, stand in his presence. That, and he's given us this privilege to actually live in his presence forever. And that can begin right now. But we have to stand. We have to, our feet have to be on the solid rock. That our dominion can be restored. That he can wash our feet and make us clean. And we have to turn to the Lord and it will lead others to turn to the Lord. That's a wonderful promise we have here from Acts 9. Now also in Acts 11, talks about the church in Antioch. Actually begins with Peter's report in Jerusalem. But we hear about the church in Antioch and beginning at verse 19. As and now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake to the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So here the, the believers were scattered abroad upon the persecution of Stephen. The confirmation right here. But even though they started going into Gentile territory, they only preach to the Jews in those areas initially. And now it came time that they spoke to the Grecians, to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, preaching the Lord Jesus and it led to a great number believed. And that word believed is the, the verb form of, of the word faith, to have faith. And it means to exercise faith. That's why it's a verb. A great number exercised faith in the Lord Jesus. That's what it means to believe. And if we exercise faith in Jesus, we will turn unto the Lord. That will be the, the outworking of believing, of exercising faith. To have faith, we have to exercise it, and it will lead us to turn unto the Lord. And we see how this is, would be for both the Jews and now the Gentiles, the Grecians. 
after the stoning of Stephen, after the process of seven was complete for the remnant, the true remnant at the time of the first advent, then the message went to the Gentiles and they also turned and it says a great number here. We know historically that ultimately it was far more Gentiles who accepted than Jews, sadly. And sadly, again, we can expect the same result today. We should also be encouraged. That there are many who will accept and believe and join with the faithful remnant. And we have also in Acts chapter 14, here is where um, is Paul and Barnabas, yeah, Paul and Barnabas were pe preaching here in Lystra, I think it said, yes, and They were doubting in their minds, and then the Lord turned things around, and Paul heals an impotent man, crippled from his mother's womb. Interestingly, he stands upright, so he's turning to the Lord, and he leaped and walked. Very interesting, and then they suddenly turned and thought, Paul and Barnabas were like gods, and they started worshiping them as Jupiter and Mercury. And Paul and Barnabas could, could scarcely turn them from their purpose of making a sacrifice to them. And here in verse 15, or 14 and 15, we'll read Acts 14, verses 14 and 15. It says, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out, and saying, sirs, why do ye these things? We are men of like, we also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained the people, and they had not done sacrifice unto them. Brother Chris, you had a question? No, it was more of a strange statement. I remember watching uh, evangel uh, preachers on TV that were supposedly healers, and, suppose and the people would uh, stay on the ground after they were being healed, and People would talk in various languages and they wouldn't speak any languages. But what you just said is the man jumped up immediately and was healed and was dancing. But when you look at preachers that were supposedly healers, people would never do all this stuff. And I thought it was interesting. They're sort of like mocking God saying, oh, we can do it, but we can't do it like he can because I just thought that was just interesting. That's all. Uh, absolutely. They, they often kind of like tremble and stumble and barely move and then seem to get up or something, but no. it's, it's not the same. It's just not the same thing. It's a right. counterfeit. So absolutely, brother. You, you, you're very right. And we see we have to test the miracles by the word because there's many false spirits gone out. So... Um, but we see here, and when we see actually the ones here, they, they actually saw a true miracle from God, but was, that, was it a right reaction that they had? No, it was actually a really bad reaction that they had to the point where they wanted to worship the men whom God was just working through, mm -hmm. or just the instruments of, of God's power being manifest. Um, but they, they immediately give credit to God and identi correctly identify themselves to them. In fact, by identifying themselves with them, we're just like you. Mm -hmm. we, we have like passions. We are 
are not like God, is really what they were saying. And <clears throat> but we preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities, this all forms of false worship of setting up a false image in my mind of God and then worshiping that, whether that involves making an actual exterior idol or making an idol of something else or just making an idol in my mind. I, 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 there, these are vain forms of worship, of obedience. That's what really what worship is. But we say here it's to turn to the living God. And he's described as a living God because he's the one who made, because he's the creator of life itself. And he can recreate us with a new life in Christ. That's what turning is all about. Turning from the false to the true. From worshiping the creature to worshiping the creator. Interesting, the connection we see in any of these. So the, we, if we're seeing the seals, the first four seals connected with the, the three angels' messages plus the fourth angel, what's, what's the first angel's message say? Which would be connected with the first, the first rider on the horse in white with his bow and his crown. Well, the first angel's message is fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment to come and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. You see a direct connection right here with the seals, the, very, the first seal, actually. See, the first seal is being broken here by Paul and Barnabas to this Gentile group. Now that the stoning of Stephen, the process of seven has been completed for God's people, and now that process is being initiated with an anointing of the Spirit for the next group. And they're going right to the first angel's message because it's still the, the first message for them. They're repeating the process. Well, it's a beautiful example we have here in Acts 14. And then actually in the very next chapter, interesting, we have so many examples here in the book of Acts of this turning process, which all the Acts were, were an after the cross experience. It was a consequence of what Christ accomplished on the cross and confirming the covenant in, the, in one prophetic week, a process of seven in the midst of the week that the outgrowth, the outworking of his victory for us leads to the message going forward, first to the Jews, then to the Samaritans, then to the uttermost parts of the earth, each going through the same message, hearing Christ and him crucified and seeing themselves for the way they really are and then brought to a point of needing to make a choice on one side or the other as the process is coming to maturity and then power being given from God supernaturally to bring a transformation to complete the process. Happening over and over again here. And that process, that perfect process, that's why it's the process of seven, repeats for each group. But staggered at different times because judgment begins at the house of God and starts with the ancient men before the house. So Acts 15, where we have the famous council in Jerusalem over the issue of circumcision. And here we have a, the We have the, the dispute over Paul's and Barnabas' preaching and the consequences of it. And 
they come and give their report to the apostles and elders and there's much disputing and then peter has something to say and then james stands up and at the end and gives the report of the the interpretation and understanding given by the holy spirit of what to do in the situation and beginning at verse 19 oh, oh i can begin before well why don't we read it it's beautiful we can start at verse 13 and after they held their peace james answered saying men and brethren hearken unto me Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. See, that's what this process is about, separating out people for his name, the subjects of his kingdom. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this will I return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Verse 19, wherefore my sentence is, so God knows everything and God is the one who's chosen the Gentiles and God has said it before in prophecy and God proved it and in, in, and sanctified it by pouring out his spirit on the Gentiles. And he knows all things and he knew everything from the beginning. That's what James is saying. Therefore, wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Going through the choosing to go through this turning process, which involves going through a personal cross experience. If we're turning to the Lord, then we'll be going through this process of seven, of perfection, of perfecting our characters. That's the work that he's doing. And we have to go through our own cross experience where we're brought to our own process of maturation that then leads to us becoming witnesses. And we're not to trouble them that turn from the Gentiles with the issue of circumcision. The circumcision here they're talking about it was the circumcision of the flesh, but the flesh is actually a symbol of our fallen human nature, which isn't connected with the circumcision of the heart. That's the circumcision that actually hasn't been done away with. That's the circumcision that you actually need in order to be saved. It's actually the circumcision that is the outworking of the promise that he is saving us. He's transforming us from the way we were. That's that changing circumcision of the heart cutting away that from the heart which is wrong and not needed and when people are going through this process of turning we're not to trouble them by trying to direct and control that process as they're going through it but now, when you, when you other than to true. lift up clear fundamental principles which he talks about here pollution from idols and from fornication from th things strangled and from blood yes brother chris then no, no, you explain it just then okay yes so but the issues of the heart and how we're changed we you know what we you know things like what we eat how we dress uh, what we watch what we listen to um these are these are issues of the heart and to try to force and control people and say if you don't do this then you're not saved is unnecessarily creating an unnecessary burden that is interrupting this turning process this turning to the lord it's also essentially setting ourselves up as the one to be the standard for others rather than having them for themselves, see it from and hear God's voice from his word and be convicted themselves and choose to obey him. That's a totally different thing than me telling somebody you're supposed to eat this or you're supposed to do that. And you're, you know, you can't be right with God if you don't. That's 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 God's work, not our work. We're not to get in the way of God doing his work of turning 
these Gentiles to the Lord. And, and think about how many Adventists and have turned people away who wanted to turn to God by setting up rigid rules like the Pharisees. And it's all rooted in a righteousness by works mindset. And the Holy Spirit is working here to have them see it's all about righteousness by faith. That is what's needed. And that's a work of an individual work of the heart. That is this turning process. Um, we also have an Acts chapter 16. And interesting. It actually has a title here in my Blue Letter Bible as the first convert in Europe in Acts 16, starting in verse 14, says a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple in the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, if ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination meets us, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and accused them of troubling the whole city. And actually the whole empire. <laughs> by breaking the laws of the empire, supposedly. Very interesting. So we see here the turning in verse 18 is Paul in dealing with one who had a familiar spirit, a demon-possessed woman, in the time when these things are going to be happening in our day, there's demon-possessed people in this world. And Satan's going to use them to try to discredit the true servants of God. And here, so Paul is out doing the work of evangelism for the Lord, faithful, reaching people and having a great influence. And so Satan sends this demon-possessed woman to follow them around everywhere and telling everybody something that was actually a very true statement, but it was bringing discredit upon it because the statement was now being associated with this demon-possessed woman instead of the message of God through Paul. And in that situation, they turned and were able to, because they had gone through the turning process themselves, they were able to, in the name of Christ, command the spirit to depart. When we come into a love-obedience relationship with Christ, our King, and we're with him everywhere we go, then he can command all any evil spirit to depart. There's none that he cannot command not to depart. And if he allows any to stay, there's a reason. We see he didn't immediately command this woman to depart. God didn't prevent it from happening. But instead, he gave them the power to actually, because they were obeying God's command, then they were able to command the demon to depart. Because it was the will of God that the demon depart. 
to me where their thinking was in harmony with the king and the true king. They were the servants of the most high God and they were showing the way of salvation. But we see this woman who was being manipulated by, by demons was actually mercifully delivered in the midst of the situation. It ended up causing uh, a great uproar, but that actually led to more conversions. That's when they were in jail and singing and the jailer and his whole household were converted. It was the end of the chapter. More turning to the Lord. We, as we work on the process of addition, the Lord brings through the process of multiplication. Here we also have in Acts chapter 26, one of my favorite passages in Acts about Paul, his defense before Agrippa. And he gives a inspired account of his own turning process. In fact, as we go through the turning process, Christ himself is the hinge of that turning process, by the way. That's why he's the man of Galilee, the hinge, the turning point at the cross. He's going through, he had gone through his own turning process. And so he uses it as his testimony to draw others that they might turn to the Lord as well. And he's, God used him to, to preach not just to the man on the street, but here to, to kings and the powerful of his day. And he also recounts, and so he gives the whole story. He doesn't color his story to make himself look good, but he actually makes it clear that he was a, had, that he was a persecutor, that he put people to death for, because of his religious zealotry, and that he had authority at the time of his turning process, his conversion, that he had authority to now spread this work of persecution, enforcing the will. And then it was at midday, which by, by the way, it's the same word as in the midst. Always a, because that's where we go through our turning processes at the cross, through our personal cross experience, where the cross becomes reality for us, just like, they did, like the apostles, went through the actual cross experience and the reality of Christ dying for, the, for them was their living experience. And he'll bring us through a process where it becomes a living experience for us as well. That's his process as part of this turning process. It's his promise. And it's the light shines from heaven that is what leads. By the way, that's the first angel's message is the light shines. <laughs> and then second angel's message, what's in the darkness is exposed. And third angel's message is, which are you going to choose? And fourth angel's message is there's power from God to make your choice a reality. But right there, he starts with the light shining, how we're fallen to earth. We see the the whole process, Paul going through it right here, being summarized. So the light shines from heaven. They're all fallen to earth. That's darkness. When the, when the evil angels fell, the, the powers of darkness, they fell to the earth. And he is called to choose. Why are you persecuting me? And then he gives him another purpose. It actually was God's purpose all along, but in, in order for, for Paul to, to make the right choice, he has to rise and stand upon thy feet. 
He has to now be able to stand in the presence of the king. That's the only way he can do it. And then he'll be able to stand in the presence of earthly kings because he was able to stand in the presence of the heavenly king. He wants to make him a minister and witness of what you've seen and those things in which I will appear unto thee. So you're going to give your testimony and I'm going to use you to lead others to also go through their turning process. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. So you see, as a mission to preach to the people, that's the Jews, and to the Gentiles, but especially to the Gentiles, because no one had yet been appointed explicitly for that purpose, or they didn't recognize that they had been all along. Really, we all have been. And it's verse 18, is the key verse here we're looking at to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of satan unto god that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me so here we have a beautiful description of what's involved in the turning process you see it involves turning from darkness to light, which requires the eyes to be open. The reason why they're in darkness is because their eyes are shut. We need to have our eyes open that we can see the light. And that will lead to a turning from the power of Satan unto the power of God. That's what this turning involves if we're going to be able to see the messages and understand them and turn from the power of satan unto the power of god from darkness to light and if our eyes are going from closed to open then we're, we're waking up we asleep eyes closed in darkness awake eyes open to the light to see the light to behold the light, him who is the light, to be transformed and changed. To have forgiveness of sins and inheritance through those that are sanctified. Justification and sanctification. Justification comes from Christ's sacrifice for us at the heart at the turning point in the midst of the pattern of seven at the cross that's where we're justified where we receive forgiveness of sins and then if we accept that and become his obedient willing children then he will bring us through a process of sanctification by faith as we accept what he did for us at the cross Then he can do the work of sanctification, of cleansing and healing. Beautiful example here with Paul and his personal testimony, which is always our best witness. We see at the personal, personal level itself, Paul goes through the same exact process. All four steps are right there. The light, the exposing of the darkness, the having to make a choice, and the power from God to bring about the transformation, the sanctification. All right there in Paul's testimony of turning. And then your witness to others leads them for the process to initiate for them. And here at the end of the book of Acts, Paul again quotes, I believe, from Isaiah, yes. Which I believe he quoted earlier, but we'll look at it again very quickly since it was a previous study. So 
Let me go back. You know, this is the end of the book of Acts. They land safely in Malta, and then Paul arrives at Rome, and he's allowed visitors and so forth. And he recounts his story there as well, how he ended up under arrest, even though he had done nothing wrong. And it was all concerning this sect, the ones who believe, who exercise faith, where it's just everywhere spoken against. And that time is upon us again where those who exercise faith will be everywhere spoken against. And that's verse 22 of Acts 28. And then verse 23, and when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning until evening. So he testifies of Jesus. He becomes that witness, and he's testifying of the kingdom of God. He's not just testifying about God. He's testifying about the kingdom of God, about what it means that God is your king, what it means that he is to rule in your life, that he is the one who's in charge. He is the one who makes the rules, the laws. He is the one who has the power. He is the one who gets the victory. He is the one we serve and obey. He is the one that we marry and love. And he persuades them concerning Jesus, that he is the true king. He does it both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, to the law and to the testimony. They speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. But he's shining the true light. So he's speaking according to the law and to the testimony. By the way, the law of Moses, that's connected with the first half of the process of seven, the first three and a half years, and the prophets, that's connected with the second three and a half years. And you see that from Christ's pattern when he confirmed the covenant for one week. He confirmed the law of Moses, and then after the cross, his heavenly ministry confirmed the testimony of the prophets. And the result is, so the preaching of the word is going forth again to yet a new group here and of the Gentiles in Rome, ultimately. Very interesting. That's where the final witness is given here in the book of Acts is in Rome. And it says, and some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. A separating process. We talked, we saw when we, we saw the first four steps of the first four seals, the four horses, bringing the process to complete maturity in the time of the fourth, that it's a, a work of separation, of sealing into those who accept the everlasting gospel or those who reject the everlasting gospel. And here we see some believed and some believed not. Verse 25, and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost. So they agreed not among themselves. There will be a final separation process between those who exercise faith and those who don't exercise faith. And Paul has one final word about that. And he says, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. He's actually speaking to Jews here in Rome first. Very interesting. 
And then he says, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And it actually led to a great reasoning amongst the Jews themselves. Very interesting. So, but we see here that we have dull hearts or dull of hearing and our hearts are wax gross, all puffed up and our eyes are closed. And we see that what's needed in, as far as this conversion, that's, this, this, that's the same word, epistrepho, that they should be converted and I should heal them. So conversion evolves through healing. If we want true healing, we need to consent to the conversion process, to the turning process. The turning happens as a consequence of my choice, as there's my consent. But it will lead us to be able to see with our eyes and hear with our ears and understand with our hearts, to have discernment because we're coming into harmony with the thinking of our heavenly husband and king. We see things the way he sees things and we under hear things the way he hears them. And that leads us to understanding correctly in our hearts. By the way, to be willing to stand under, the way we stand in his presence is we stand under his dominion willingly. Stand under the branch and his rightful rule. So there we see the turning process in the book of Acts.